User research is a key part of service design, but often it can be hard to actually do proper user research. And there are a lot of reasons for that. In this episode, we're going to explore how you can take your user research practice to the next level within your team and organization and overcome some of the most common hurdles. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Steve Portugal, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 127. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the hidden things that make the difference between success and failure? All to help you design services that make a positive impact on people, and business. The guest in this episode is an author, a speaker, and a recognized expert on the topic of user research. His name is Steve Portugal. It's nothing new that user research is a key part of service design, but often it's very challenging to actually do good user research. You don't get the time, you don't get the budget. When you're doing research, often it's not the right type of research you wanna do. You're doing more validating research than explorative research. So there are many reasons why user research isn't yet making the impact it potentially could. And sometimes that can feel you left stuck when you're the only one seeing the value of user research while the people around you don't. So in this episode, Steve and I decided to have an open conversation and explore what it takes to take user research to the next level. And what does that next level even mean? So this episode isn't as much about giving answers as it's about finding better questions. If you enjoy conversations like this that help you to build your craft as a service design professional, make sure you click that subscribe button and that bell icon to be notified when new episodes come out. So now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Steve Portugal. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Hey, Mark. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. Do you remember which episode you were in? <laughs> no, I, <had laughs> I should to have looked that up. I had to look it up as well. It's uh, It was episode 52, so that's quite a long time ago. Like every two weeks an episode, it's uh, over two years. So it's, it's good that we're revisiting and redoing uh, this. Steve, the last time you were on, uh, we had a different format. We were raising cards, we were co-creating things. Uh, things have changed uh, uh, a little bit. Um, I wanted to start with a rapid fire question round, but I'm not going to do that yet because um, for the people who see you for the very first time and have no clue who Steve Portugal is, could you give like a very brief introduction? Yes, yeah, so if you've never seen me before and have no clue who I am, I am uh, an independent consultant. I work outside of the just outside of the San Francisco Bay Area. The uh, you know my professional focus is uh, user research. I've written a couple of books, which you can see behind me on user research. Um, done a lot of conference talks over the years. Been teaching people as well as practicing. Yeah, user research for. I mean, 25 years, uh, I guess, if you start doing the math. You live, eat, and sleep, use research. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I eat donuts, but I do, I do live and sleep uh, user research. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, now, it's time for the rapid fire question round. Again, this is new, but it's very easy. Just answer these questions as quickly as you can. You haven't prepared, and that's uh, part of the plan. So the first question is, what's always in your fridge? Water. Okay. Uh, which book or books are you reading at this moment, if any? Uh, I, yes, yeah, so of course, the titles are on a device or on, um, or on the side of the bed. I'm reading four things right now uh, uh one is a graphic novel it's a long series that's kind of a parody of i don't know it's uh it's it's called as name something like uh, big hard sex criminals and it's uh it's very silly but it's kind of uh entertaining um 
I am reading a book of short stories by an author whose name I can't remember and the title of the book I can't remember. Uh, again, it's on the device. Um, I'm reading uh, an annual collection of science fiction stories from like 2006 that I think is the size of a phone book, if anyone remembers what a phone book used to be. Um, and I'm reading a book of essays about famous cover songs, like re-record, an artist does a song and then someone else uh, does it, records it later. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually really, really fascinating because in each, in each story about a famous song, we probably know the new one, but there's an original one. There's all this uh, history. Why was this song where it was when it first came out and what did it mean and who recorded it? And then what did it mean and how did culture change or how did media change when this other version came out? Um, so there's these just amazing essays that kind of teach you about, yeah, history of the blues or Americana and so on. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely little book. Geeking out on, on music tracks. Uh, awesome. Um, next question is, what superpower would you like to have? What superpower would I like to have? Oh, seems like we should we should all have like the ready answer to this one. Um, uh, I would like. I mean, I'm my superpower. If I could have anyone, would be to understand what's in somebody's mind. Mind reading. I, mean, I guess <laughs> mind reading, ESP, or understanding. I mean, no surprise that I picked a profession where I try to do that um, because, of course, navigating life is hard hmm. if you can't if you don't know what you're always trying to figure that out anyway so that would be a great superpower hmm. the other question i have is what did you want to become when you were a kid i thought about uh being some kind of entertainer like i was going to be a stunt man and i was going to be an actor and i was going to be a director and i was going to be a writer uh, those were sort of romantic kind of uh, aspirations. Well, you 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 managed the writing part. Yeah, I, I, and when I published the first book, I realized, oh, this is a childhood dream realized, but not in the way that I thought it was going to be. <laughs> but yes, thanks for recognizing that. Yeah. Um, and the final question, which you did already answer in episode 52, but uh, in case some people forgot, including me, what is the first time you got in touch with service design? It's the first time I got in touch with service design. <sighs> um, you know, I think service design started finding its way into uh, design conferences, um, um, especially because service design is kind of anchored in, uh, you know, has maybe more, especially historically, you know, more prevalence in different parts of the world. So I, I remember going to conferences. I don't know if I could put a date on it. Um, and this is a design conference and maybe you've got some UX people, like a new word that's getting thrown around or, um, uh, and there would be some service design people there, or they would throw that word into their description of what they were doing. Um, and, and I think a few years later, there was a like an international service design conference in San Francisco that I went to. And, you know, lots of the same people talking about lots of the same things, mm. uh, but kind of under the, the umbrella of service design. So I, I can't give you an exact date, but that's sort of the, the narrative form. The conferences. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Cool. So that was it for the rapid uh, rapid question rapid question fire round. That's not the thing I wanted to say. I wanted to say something different, but never mind. Um, let's dive into the topic of today. I uh, I'm I'm really interested in this topic. This is really going to be an exploration. We're going to verbally prototype <laughs> where this uh, can lead us. Um, I hope that at the end of this, uh, this chat we'll have better questions rather than having answers. So uh, let's see if we can find some better questions around user research maturity, right? Because that's the topic you sort of suggested that we might dive into. And I'm curious, what makes you interested in user research maturity at this moment? I think it's an interesting lens to look at the 
practice, you know, or what, what we do, how user research is being done, um, because there's so much success, um, numbers of people, uh, numbers of job descriptions, numbers of, uh, of um, you know, uh, open requisitions for employees to become researchers and join a team, uh, number of conferences, number of books, uh, you know, podcasts, whatever. It's clear that there's a lot of people doing it, wanting to do it, learning to do it. Uh, we're teaching each other. At the same time as all this growth and, and, and evolution is happening, there's a lot of uh, dissatisfaction that I hear and that I observe and that I experience myself with, you know, how research is being practiced. Um, so a lot of people seem kind of stuck. There's a lot of uh, agitating or really, you know, advocating for more and better. Um, and so I think, you know, you, when you put the word maturity out there, it kind of, to me, it, it, it says, um, you know, let's look at where we are and where we want to go. It, it starts to suggest evolution over time. Um, and and uh, uh, maybe having those discussions is a way to, for any of us that feel stuck at different points to kind of get unstuck. So, uh, okay. Um, let, let's get into the getting stuck part. Like, what is it that you hear people say? Like, what are the signals or how do these being stuck things manifest themselves in practice yes um and i i have definite empathy for for people being stuck and i admit to having some frustration um uh because i find myself um you know at book author and podcast guest type person in some situations like mark it doesn't matter what i'm talking about if I'm in something interactive, the questions that come to me are often the same questions. Um, uh, so there are things like, um, uh, my company doesn't believe in user research. We don't get time to do research. We only do evaluative research uh, too late in the game. Um, you know, it's it's these sort of, so that's a lot of, of being stuck. Um, I think if you have, you know, deeper conversations with the people, you hear that um, um, the the results of research are not uh, embraced. People do what they want. And these are all related, right? No one wants to ask the right questions. No one wants to do the thing that they're, they're uh, that, that we've learned. Um, I think when you go a little further, I hear a lot of people, and I don't know that this is stuck as much, uh, uh, I'm trying to get people unstuck around some of these things. Um, we talk to customers, but we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to listen and we ask leading questions. We don't know how to ask follow-ups and we just confirm what our own assumptions are. Um, I mean, the last one I think is more, it's all, it's all fixable, but I think you just hear people describe these situations where, ugh, like whatever research is, it's not, we, we know it could be something else, but like, we're here and no one will give it to us. No one will let us and no one will listen to us. It's sort of this, this deep frustration uh, that I often hear. That's what I think stuck sounds like. Hmm. And like, why are, have they always been stuck or have you seen a uh, <laughs> progression towards more frustration? Because at some point they did get hired as a user research or that they, they sort of, migrated into a user research role and at some point they got stuck right yeah right i mean i think right you and i are talking about kind of everyone out there and of course there's many different kinds of circumstances and there are, there are so you're asking about within an organization do they go back and forth between how stuck they are and how unstuck they are um, as opposed to what's the overall population and, and are we collectively stuck or unstuck? Because for sure there are lots of success stories. Um, I mean, nobody's perfect, but there are lots of examples to look to where things, some of these things are not stuck. But yeah, look at the, look at some of these organizations. Um, 
I think in some cases they were not hired to do research. Uh, you have, you know, UX teams of one type type of, of situations where uh, this person is a designer is kind of their title. Um, and they're trying to create change along a lot of fronts. For sure, they have concerns about how design is being practiced that I'm not hearing about. They may feel just as stuck there. Uh, but they're the person that's saying, hey, we're making decisions that have a lot of assumptions in them. And if we don't involve users in these decisions, we're going to waste all of our design and engineering and product and service effort. Um, and there's a person without without the title. Uh, they're assuming the responsibility, but they're not kind of given the responsibility. Uh, and so, yeah, they are stuck, right? Mm. I mean, for a certain, a certain way. Um, I think you have user research teams that are that evolve where there are researchers and they're doing research, but they're not in the position that they want to be. So, um, you know, teams without leaders uh, or teams with leaders that uh, maybe don't, uh, I mean, teams without research leaders, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Someone that can uh, advocate for how research can best perform in the organization. Like I heard a story from people a few years ago where, um, it was, uh, it was like a special projects department. Well, I don't have, I mean, they were very public about it. I don't have to, to hide who it is. It was, uh, Google X, like the moonshot factory. Um, and this was like a person with a graduate degree in human factors. And they were maybe like a first, first year as a researcher. Um, and what they, they, they almost described like, um, like some kind of laboratory uh, function where they would receive requests that were like handed to a manager and then were literally just handed to them. They would execute on those requests and write it up and then just share a document with somebody. So there was no collaboration. There was no stakeholder management. They had no power to, um, you know, understand the real problem and reframe it and kind of dig into it. It was just, here is the research. Go do exactly what we're telling you. Uh, it was a few years ago, so I don't. I mean, Google X is not even the same organization that it used to be, but I don't think that's super uncommon. Um, so yeah, like there's a story about hey, we're hiring human factors grads. We're doing all kinds of research, but if you look a little closer, you're like this is not. This doesn't seem the right way to kind of get all the value and kind of creativity out of the research that you are doing. So you know, yeah. depending on who you talk to. That's a long answer, Mark. Yeah. Right? That's some <laughs> well, of my thoughts about. Good. That's why we're here to, to uh, pick your brain. And um, so <clears throat> an easy, I, I was looking for, so what does, uh, if this is a, a low level of maturity, uh, like the, all the opposite things of what you just said could be a higher level of maturity. But I'm curious, like um, without getting too deep into semantics, what is user research maturity uh, to you? And I'm looking for how would you define a quote unquote success? How would you define progress? And again, it's not about semantics, like just yeah. how you see it. Yeah. I mean, the word maturity, you know, comes from these maturity models that, uh, that go back, actually go back to the seventies from Harvard business school. Um, and they looked at IT rollout. And so this, so I am kind of stealing the model, uh, the m maturity model. Um, there's a classic, uh, you know, the, the OG user research maturity model was something that Chris Avore wrote a few years ago. And, and he kind of broke down um, into certain categories from like laggard to what I can't remember his exact categories, but he, he characterized it in a kind of a grid. Um, and I, I'm less interested in being as prescriptive, like, here's my grid. And if you're here, then this, and if you're there, then that, I, I mean, if your question is like, what does progress look like? I think, I think it's up to us to assess where we are now, um, in a little bit more of an evaluative way than, ah, no, no, we can't do anything. Um, but to try to describe and characterize where we are now and to articulate, you know, where would things be different? Um, and I think, you know, when you ask yourselves those questions, you can say, like, 
what's the what's the dream state or what's an increment um so i'm not interested in having people if it if it were to be a grid fill in every single cell in this grid with every everything but just to take a thing that you are stuck on like um you know hey we're not um we're not engaging with stakeholders to to make sure that uh, you know, the research that we're doing is really connecting with what their needs are. Uh, you know, if you can describe that, that's less mature. Can you describe a future state um, and then start to plan what would you do to make uh, to make steps towards that? So it's it's kind of a problem solving and facilitation mindset, I guess. Um, yeah. Mark, let me let yeah. me stop and let, let you jump back in. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think we've seen uh, a lot of maturity models in the design space lately, um, and I totally get where they are coming from. I think it's very useful for for people to have like a perspective of what's possible. I think uh, when you're at a low level of maturity, it's really hard to even come up with a dream state. Uh, and these maturity models maybe help to... Um, uh, uh, to give a guide or to 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 yeah. show to to help you understand and uh, see and better articulate where the gaps are. I don't think, uh, like you just said, uh, I totally agree that these models should be leading, but they can be guiding, right? Uh, so I, I I do see value in them in that sense. Uh, how do you see that? Yes, we're just trying to drive a conversation. Um... Yeah, I mean, leading versus guiding, that's very interesting. I haven't thought about the difference between those two things. Well, the, the goal um, isn't to to sort of level up in the maturity model, right? That's not the goal. The, the, the maturity model is, is facilitating something else, and it helps you to sort of uh, find milestones, see... Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, it expands your vocabulary, maybe. If you're already super experienced, then you can like the a maturity model becomes less relevant maybe but especially if you're trying to get the rest of the organization interested then showing them like hey this is where we could go or this is where other organizations have been yes i yes and, and i and i i think i'm interested in like what's the it's not, it's not quite a meta maturity model. It's like, what's the lesson of models? And can we just kind of play with that for a little bit? So yes, yeah, so one thing is you can show the organization, here's what good looks like, because you don't know, because this is new. Um, I, I think the power, the thing that I'm excited about in maturity models is that, uh, is the way that they kind of decompose. Like if we say, my company doesn't get research. Well, then we can start to break that down. And so if you look at, Chris Avore's model or some of the things that I'm interested in or any of the other models, they start looking at different um, components of the user research practice so that you can ask specific questions. Uh, I think that's powerful because it, in your point about uh, kind of guiding, it, it highlights facets of research that maybe you haven't considered. Uh, that, um, and of course, you know, you put it in a grid and it looks very clean. Um, uh, I sound like I'm criticizing people using the grid. I don't, I don't mean that. Um, but, you know, we have models and they suggest something. Um, they kind of suggest that like, oh, these are the things. And, and this is the granularity. Like what, what would get a, a row in, 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 in any kind of hypothetical model? Um, but if you look at it a different way, there's you can kind of change the granularity going up and down and going up and down. Like the example we just had about um, researchers don't engage with stakeholders. Like that could be quite far nested in the, you know, if you sort of take a topic and a subtopic and a subtopic and a subtopic. Um, and maybe that's where you want to focus. Or, you know, because when you say, um, you know, uh, I don't know, research goal alignment, it's like, Ugh, that's that's a lot. Well, let's kind of go down a level. Oh, that's um, you know that's this other piece, or maybe this other piece, and you kind of get to a thing that um, you can affect. Um, so you know, 
I think it's up to the people in the organization, the people that are trying to drive change, whether they want to talk about big problems and break them down into small problems or start with small problems and maybe ladder up to big problems. And it's, there's no right way to do this, to kind of mm. take these on and, and work with them. I don't think. Well, then that, that's, that there's a danger in uh, making it appear as if there was a right way to do it. Right. There is, there is like, you can, you can see it as a compass or, uh, show what people have done in the past, but uh, there is no guarantee that this will also work for you. You mentioned something about people who want to uh, create change within organizations. One question I had about um, progressing in this user research maturity in whatever shape or form that is for you, there is always somebody in the organization uh, who is that decision maker, who needs to invest in this, who needs to uh, make time, make make budget available what is your take on involving those people how do you open the conversation with these decision makers to start investing in user research maturity i mean i think as with every sort of negotiation and persuasion right it's talking about um Talk about what they care about. Um, so, I mean, back to the example, people who are stuck and they say, well, like, my company doesn't give me time to do user research. Like, well, that's, as a practitioner, that's the thing I care about. As, you know, a leader or someone who's going to invest, that may not be a thing that they care about. Um, so asking for process I think can be risky because more likely people who are influencers and decision makers care about outcomes. Um, but again, you know, that's a general statement. I don't know. I don't know your, your, your influencer and decision maker. So understanding what they care about um, and um, you know, yeah. what problems yeah. do yeah. you have? Yeah. So again, here, the goal isn't user research maturity. That's not the goal. It's fa it facilitates something else, and it might facilitate uh, faster time to market. It might facilitate cheaper service development. Like those are the things that you are enabling when you start to improve your user research practice. And th those are the things you should be talking about, right? That's that's the overall gist, I guess. That's well put. Yeah. Hmm. Um, one question I had was with regards to ownership and responsibility. Now, uh, as a practitioner, you can sort of start investing in your own, in, in your own professional growth and development. And you could say, I'm becoming a better practitioner. As soon as it starts to become a team or an organization on a level, uh, I'm curious, who do you feel or what have you seen um, in the organization? Who owns this? Who Who is responsible? And again, it, it differs from organization to organization. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's really different in, in, in organizations that have a user research leader, someone who has that title, um, where that person does a lot of things, but one of the, one of them is um, is think about, you know, I mean, a good leader, a good manager thinks about the skills and career progression of their team, um, and so having having someone who advocates for research in whatever way, right? If I work at a company and the person I report to, let's just say they they get research. Um, uh, and they advocate for it and they can advocate for my own, my skill development. They can create space, provide resources, um, help me as an individual assess and, and, and build. Um, but what I hear a lot of research leaders talking about too is, is taking a team view of this and, and is what they're trying to do. It's not just skill development for its own sake, but it's back to, um, you know, what you were, what we were both saying before what is the company looking for us to do or what do we want to help the organization understand that we can do? How do we want to provide value uh, in the future? 
So being able to take uh, a look at, you know, what work is the company doing? What work does our team want to be doing? What skills do we have? What skills do we need to hire for or develop? Um, like when those things all go together, the, the, the products, like what is our company producing? How are we supporting it with research? And how are we equipped skill and, and staff wise to support it? Those all fit together really, really well. Uh, but someone has to, someone has to own that and care about it and put time into it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and I haven't seen a lot of those roles. Maybe they, they are already there, uh, hopefully. Um, and I was thinking maybe that's a sign of a maturity level when you have a user research leader in, in that position that you've already uh, progressed uh, at least more than uh, most companies, I guess, right? Uh, I mean, there are more, there's an increasing number of user research leaders. I mean, I think it's part of the, the, the growth overall in the practice, but, um, you know, in, in my podcast, these are the people that, that I've been interviewing over the years um, and, you know, finding finding them in, in different kinds of, of organizations. And, you know, with success stories, I think in, in uh, well, being hired, mm -hmm. like somebody before they were there, somebody identified the need that not only do we need this capability, but we need leadership in this capability again, so they can interface with other functions, advocate for the value, you know, build up teams, build up skills. Um, that's happening more and more. Um, I'm, you know, I, I mean, it'd be interesting to do a census and kind of say like, where are the companies with research leadership and where are the companies where it's a lot of UX teams of one or two that are like, oh, research, we should also be doing research. Or there is person who has got the title of a researcher, but they don't have any, they're just on their own. It's like, one researcher uh, without any kind of leadership. So I, I think, right, we can imagine the pie chart and it's just, it's a mix of all of those. From the people you've interviewed on your podcast um, and the examples, case studies you've seen, who is doing this well? Where, and um, have you identified any patterns of organizations that are actually able to take the user research practice to the next level levels. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about, uh, uh, Atlassian is an interesting one. Um, uh, and the person that runs research there is Lisa Reichelt. Um, and, uh, yeah, she's been, kind of, I've seen her speak at conferences and be critical of the company. Um, and this is, you know, this is not up to date. So I, want, I don't, don't want to, this is things I've heard in the past. Um, but she's talked about, I think, um, uh, like a strong testing culture. Uh, and so if you want to make a decision, if you, the research you would do about any decision would be to kind of, I don't know if it's literally A or B, but ask someone to evaluate something. Um, so I think it's, there's an interesting challenge there where you have a company that embraces research, but embraces like an unsuff an immature version of research. Um, Limit, uh, a limited version of research. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. even that's an even better way to put it. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, Atlassian's not a new company, so they've built like, uh, here's how we make products, here's how we do things. Uh, so research, and I've heard this from a number of people who are research leaders, research comes in later. Here's a 10 year old company with a mature product organization um, and then research is new. And so you're trying to sort of swim upstream or kind of change the mindset around how we can do this. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, so that's a different kind of change um, you yeah, know, I'm thinking yeah, also, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Well, yeah. And, and it makes a lot of sense, uh, which is saying, I, I never realized or articulated in this way, but, um, often things like user research and service design, they come in later after people, after the people who build stuff, <laughs> who make things tangible, 
have done their work. And then it's re it takes a lot of effort and uh, convincing power to change the way of working because that's what you're asking these people to do. They have they have built a successful company or business or service by doing the things that they have done so far and user research or service design hasn't been an integral part of that. And now you're coming in and saying, hey, we should do more of this other thing. Like, that's a tough sell. So I recognize absolutely what you're what you're describing there. I think there's two variations too, or maybe it's just a subtlety to what you're saying. Um, that, you know, and I can't speak as, as well to service design, but research is already happening, um, right? It's, it's your point about limited. So it's sure. not like yeah. We're, yeah. We're, we're bringing in something brand new. We're trying to take a thing that exists and, and change the way that it's practiced. Um, and that, that's interesting because it's not like everyone feels like they have a problem that they need to solve. Oh, we already do this. We test things. I know how to run a test. We're good. What is it that you're going to do that's different? Um, so you've got to, you've got to change some entrenched beliefs and that's, that's culture change, right? That's process change, but culture change. Um, and, and, and very hard to do if you don't have the leadership of the company kind of assigning that to someone like Lisa at Atlassian, who's, that's her mandate. She's the leader and she has kind of the upper management kind of giving her that brief. If you're an individual contributor at, you know, some, at, at some, uh, you know, alternative universe form of Atlassian without Lisa in it, you can't, you can't do that. You just can't get, make, you can't manage up that high. And so that's a tough call for those people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've spoken to a lot of those people uh, who are very passionate about the thing, what they do, but it's very hard to scale and to in basically what they run into is limit limits in their ability to influence decisions like you you can, you can do all the research you want you can come up with all the insights you want you can make all the improvements you want but eventually you're just one of the people uh within the operational layer of the organization yeah Right. And, and I don't know, this, this is not a, a declaration of truth, but it's a, it's a, it be a question for us. Maybe, maybe that person's effort would be, um, is about creating demand, like demand for a research team, demand for research leadership, um, uh, as opposed to, Hey, I'm going to do research, make, get this product information and insight and hope that you change the product. That is limited, but maybe if they are thinking about org change, again, they're yeah. still managing up. They're yeah. still driving change up. But can they uh, can they create awareness that, hey, this is a function, other teams have it, other orgs have it, they have leaders, this is the this is the result. Um, and start to kind of create the space for that change to happen. They still need like that's uh, that's a big challenge, I think, because if they don't have the power, they have limited influence. So, you know, I'm saying, what if you could influence this other thing? And I think it's still the same challenge for them. They have limited influence. That's the reality. That's the limit. Well, the thing I'm hearing you say here is that um, when you're in a situation where uh, user research hasn't been established on an organizational level or the maturity is low, um, and you want to change something about it, you cannot stick with just doing user research. You have to invest time into building awareness. So uh, this comes on top of the work you're actually doing. I think that's an important thing to realize. Like in every, like every day, every week, every project, you have to spend 10%, 20% of your time thinking about, okay, how am I going to influence this for the long term? Like short term, I need to deliver insights. I need to do qualitative interviews. But what am I doing that will influence and progress this capability of the organization on a longer set, scale? If you don't, well, don't complain, right? You'll always be stuck in the situation you are in. You, and there's you just a great to, example. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mark. No, go there's ahead. A great, there's a great example. Uh, 
uh, it's from a few years ago at DocuSign, um, and they had a leader and they had demand for their research. So it's a different use case than we're talking about. Um, but what they did when the demand exceeded the supply, and so they filtered projects they would take based on they would basically ask those teams to commit to making change based on the results of their research. So if the team wouldn't commit to actually doing something different, they didn't take on that project. Uh, if the team said, yes, you know, we, we need this research and here's what we're going to do as a result of the research, then they got the research. Um, again, different situation than in a sort of uh, isolated individuals managing up. But think about if you have that amount of influence, like if every project you did was one where you knew that there was going to be impact that was going to be visible. Now your portfolio, like your track record, your story about the results you're having, you don't have any projects that don't have any outcomes because you're not taking those on. And you're you're forcing, uh, because in this case of DocuSign, they had some power. They had more, they had resources that were in demand. Again, if you don't have any power, it's hard to kind of flip that around. But you can see, uh, you know, making choices in order to create stories that people can tell about successful outcomes uh, is that's that's a really powerful filter. And I and I, I love what you're saying here. Like uh, it might, it's not only when your uh, uh, craft is in demand. You should have that attitude like all the time because you're responsible for delivering success, and you know what these parameters are. You know in which conditions you are able to uh, be most successful and you're only doing a service towards the people you're working with when you're very clear upfront about that like listen if you're not going to do anything with the things i will hand you if you don't have resources if you don't have the time if you have no idea what to do with them then it's a waste of your time and it's a waste of my time so we'd better either reframe this challenge or don't don't do it at all so I being think, more being think, more critical and being more selective yeah. is very important. I, I think there's a lot of optimism in the people that do the work that we all do. Um, and, you know, I think it's easy to think, wow, this work's going to be super interesting. When they see how interesting it is, that'll change their mind. Like the results will speak for themselves. Um, and that, you know, maybe I, I don't want to be cynical. I'm try I'm an optimist as well. Um, but I, I think you're right. Like to be critical in the choice of our, of the choices we make, and maybe that's hard because we know the research is going to be awesome and, and, and who wouldn't want to, you know, serve these needs because that's what we're doing. That's why we're in this, in this field. Um, so, you know, recognizing, I mean, it's a little bit of a loss of innocence. Yeah. Not everyone's going to get as excited as you are and yeah, maybe you don't. Maybe you choose what to do. You prioritize based on uh, who's already kind of on board with you. Hmm. And and just setting yourself up for success. Like if you want to grow your practice, your field, being more critical, still being optimistic and being positive that people will change, but knowing that there are things that can increase the likelihood of you being successful and uh, the project being successful, everybody being more successful. I think that's uh, that, that's a very important thing. I'm, I'm really curious, like um, we said that we're exploring this topic here. Which questions do you still have around this topic? What are some of the things that we should be asking ourselves that maybe we aren't asking enough? I am interested in um, uh, like a superset of axes of maturity. So we're, you know, we haven't, we didn't make a bulleted list in this conversation, but we've talked about things like leadership. We've talked about things like influence. We've talked about, you know, what kind of work gets done. Um, you know, we talked about those things, but then we've even gotten into these little more granular ones like, um, relationship between researcher and stakeholder. Um, I, I'm not saying we should make this superset. Anyone should, because it might be an unnavigable thing. But um, 
I guess I'm, there are other, other aspects of maturity that we haven't talked about and that probably I am not even considering. Um, so I guess I'm interested in collectively as a field, um, starting to think about many kinds of, right. Those, those maturity models have like six or seven things, but there might be 70 or there might be 800. Um, I don't know what, I don't have a number in mind. Um, but I have blind spots and I think the reason why coming up with more of them is important is that I think any one of them, like the thing that you're excited about or that you're feeling pain about, like that's a hook to make improvement. So I can say like influence and impact and you can say, I don't get to meet with my stakeholders. Like, well, the thing that you have said that you've identified where the maturity could evolve, like that's where you should work, you know? So um, I think the more kind of ways in we have to talk about, yeah, Here's the state today. Here's a future state that we might want to work towards. The more of those we have, the more we can get unstuck. Because I, I can say, I can give you five questions you should ask yourself, and you could just look at me like, I, I don't care about any of those. But if you can come up with, you know, one or two, then we can work on like how to move it forward. Um, so yeah, I think the longer list is a. Again, I don't need this. I, I said super set, but I don't really think it's that. It's it's kind of a mindset of asking uh, questions of ourselves of what are the aspects of our maturity that we can identify that we want to improve. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And uh, I'm I'm surprised that this or that that this is there to a very limited extent for the field out expect that i don't know one of the big research companies would already have uh done some research on this but maybe it needs to be crowdsourced and a community-led uh inquiry one a question that i feel is pretty obvious here is how do you know that you're sort of not on the level that you want to be so how do you identify a lower level of maturity because usually that that uh, translates to okay that there's uh, potential for for growth. Yeah. So I think if you have researchers in the organization, there's no problem identifying those things, right? Even a junior researcher is like, oh, we're not doing this, we're not doing that. Um, and, you know, you have organizations where you have people who do research and they don't know what they don't know. Um, I mean, it's interesting, it's exciting to see like product management as a kind of professional community getting excited about research because, you know, speaking very broadly, like they love talking to customers and many of them have, uh, you know, have the humility to recognize this is not an expertise. So I, I feel good about these other disciplines, the people who do research starting to recognize their limitations. And again, I think the researchers... No. Um, and, and even if you, even if there's a part of your maturity that you don't know, that you don't know, like, that's all right. Like, you don't have to know every possible thing that you could do better. You have to know, like, what is the thing that you're complaining about? What is the frustration? Where are, um, where are you making mistakes with your products or, you know, discovering too late that something was wrong, uh, or that you had a wrong assumption? Um, yeah, you know, it's yeah. like how you and I would do it, and then there's how anybody else would do it in their in their kind of real context. Um, and I guess I'm just back to what I said before: like whatever you can identify and improve is an improvement. It doesn't have to fit into, you know, any of these models. Yeah. it's just an evolution. Yeah. yeah, so that's your beef with the models that people uh, tend to uh, over emphasize them or over. Uh, yeah, see them as as very rigid models where things have to fit in. Otherwise, you're not doing it the right way. Rather than uh, a starting point for a conversation, which might expand and adapt and be flexible. And I mean, I don't want to beef with the models. Like I am, I think Chris Avore's model is amazing. There's a D Scout model, which is 
uh, a, 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 an evolution. It's a little hard to parse, but they have a certain way of thinking about it. Um, I mean, you, I really like how you put it. The, the, those models are um, uh, serve to illustrate that there's more. Um, but I think in terms of kind of facilitation and kind of self-directed, uh, the models, the fact that there is a model is a starting point. And like, now we have to build our own, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and think of them less as kind of grids and more as like a continuum where we just want to, we want to know where we are and we want to hypothesize where we want to get to. We want to make some strides towards that. So it's more about the progress that, that we can drive than kind of, you know, fleshing out the model. So let's, uh, heading towards the end of the conversation let's let's look at the maturity on a meta level so now a lot of people in the field uh feel stuck for whatever reason um not feeling that they are making the impact that they potentially could um where will we be in three years where will we be in five years like what's the what's the dream state Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, I think we can, where are we? Well, it's, it's like, who is we? Um, I think there's lots of, I think this is, we're sort of describing like the problems of like technology companies or mm -hmm. capitalism or of the workplace um, or of, you know, research and service design kind of being, still being, a, you know, new practices. So I think this is going to continue to get replicated. Um, and I, you know, it's, uh, will the, if again, that pie chart, we sort of hypothesize, will the pie chart look any different over time? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I can't say in three or five years, we're going to be completely different. Um, I think, you know, a more modest goal for me would be to empower change makers um, to make them, you know, feel more confident or with some direction. Um, so that if you, when you say, ah, I'm stuck, there's some things you can start to do. Um, but yeah, I think there's just a lot of systemic reasons why things are the way that they are. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful, but I'm also cynical. I don't, so I don't know if I have a dream state in five years. Um, I think it's just about making steady incremental progress. My, sure. I'm yeah. Dodging, sure. Dodging your question. Well, it, well, that that's uh, that's still a valid a valid state. Uh, I don't know if it's a, if we would describe it as a dream state, but that's still a progress and a valid state. I was imagining um, like that. There's a more uh, mature vocabulary, and that there's uh, more of an idea of a roadmap. I don't know if roadmap is the is the right word because you might ha get the feeling that you have to follow the roadmap but um at least uh see routes and alternative routes towards finding solutions to like you mentioned being stuck and getting unstuck and doing better work can i take another shot then do it so so you know i think i mean what i what i'm intrigued by in the discussions about you know maturity is that um, it's kind of an umbrella for a lot of work that I see people doing people that are, you know, uh, here's a workshop I've got, I'm going to publish it on medium uh, uh, talk that at a conference like this, it's a lot of sharing in the in the practice. I mean, podcasts where we discuss things like you, like you're doing. Um, uh, but I feel like uh, this is not quite the right thing. I'm, you know, if we had an information architect, they would say this better. You can imagine uh, sort of the maturity conversation as sort of an index. And I'm, I want to be, that's maybe not the right word, but an index to tools that already exist or tools that are being built, um, right? Well, one, uh, one, one aspect of maturity might be um, how do we even pick what methods we should use to solve something? Well, you can go look at Christian Rohr's paper uh, from 2014, uh, when to use which user experience research method, which probably many people have seen. It's an almost ubiquitous reference. There's a section in that document that says, if you're doing this, use this method. If you're doing this, use this method. Um, so when we talk about maturity, like 
it, it can be a way to, and this is sort of what you're saying, right? If you can identify the gaps that you have, there, there's potentially already a solution there. Um, but Christian Rohr's paper is sitting over here and, you know, um, DocuSign filtering is kind of over here. I'm kind of playing with, yeah, kind of an umbrella or an index as we think about these things. Can we find, I mean, maybe this is my dream. I don't want to articulate it as a dream because I don't know if it's the right thing. But, I mean, imagine sort of an, an index or an, uh, an expert system that you could query that kind of talks about, you know, hey, here's the maturity that we're looking at. Um, there is like a paper, a resource, a podcast, a tool, a workshop you can run a best case, a best reference um, that you can apply to start moving forward. And right now, all that stuff is sort of scattered. Like yeah. our expertise as a practice is diffuse. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe what I'm doing is a little bit of kind of aggregating and synthesizing that. Yeah. All right. That's kind of my, that's, a, that's an audacious dream, but that is sort of my dream sure. that we had a way to kind of, uh, you know, come with a problem and walk away with uh, with a next step. And and do it with less effort, faster, and more, be more effective. Because, you know, when we when you synthesize these things, make them more accessible, uh, we can actually spend more of our time doing the work we want to do and less time looking on Google, trying to figure out which resource we need to have, right? That's, that's I guess, the the big benefit here. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, there's a lot of smart people doing a lot of smart work and, you know, most of us haven't heard of most of it. So how do we connect to that? If, uh, what is the thing you hope, what is the one thing you hope people will remember from our conversation in episode 127? Um, well, it's, it's a it's a combination of a couple of things. I, well, okay, if I had to say one thing, it's um, focus on what's important to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I gave a short answer, Mark. You weren't yes, prepared for that. Thank you. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. And now uh, one thing is is all we need. Uh, focus on what's important to you. Sure. I uh, I couldn't agree more, Steve. I know we could have talked uh, for another hour and uh maybe we should do that in a in a future episode but for now we're going to wrap this up i'm going to thank you uh for diving into this topic of user research maturity let's say let's see where uh will be where the field will be in uh, in about three years and how this one contributed thanks again thanks mark Awesome that you're still here at the end of this conversation. I hope that you enjoyed it. And if you did, take two seconds to click that like button because that will help YouTube to get this conversation in front of other professionals who might enjoy it as well. And while you're here, click that subscribe button if you haven't done so already to get notified about new conversations like this. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.